you, Jeff. Welcome everyone. My name is Megan Ingram. I wanna thank our four panelists and all of the attendees for joining us today. We're here to reflect on how to advance primary care in California through aligned payment. And this panel has really come together based on a white paper that Blue uh, Shield of California commissioned to advocate for alignment across payers with the goal of shoring up the future of primary care in the state. There's a link to this paper that can be found in the chat below, um, and it will also be available at the end of the session as well. The paper built upon uh, a recent report from the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine, or NASM, called Implementing High Quality Primary Care, which really argued for, for hybrid models as a default mode of primary care payment going forward. And the objective of the Blue Shield and Manat paper was really to surface themes around how population-based payment can support an equitable and sustainable future for primary care in California going forward. In developing the paper, we interviewed a broad set of stakeholders, including purchasers, practices, payers, and associations. The paper really outlined the impact of COVID-19 on practices and how current payment mechanisms endangered primary care in the face of the public health emergency. In the midst of the pandemic, California Healthcare Foundation found that a third of practices were at risk of permanent closure due to their financial position. And the paper articulated the value for alignment across payers, known as multi-payer alignment, and how such alignment can really support practices with both flexibility and incentives to improve quality and result in better population health. The conclusion of the paper lays out a call to action, of really how to drive alignment across the state. And we're here today to discuss the opportunities for how stakeholders in California and across the nation can really achieve these important objectives collectively. Now we intentionally brought key stakeholders here today to discuss how stakeholders in California can build on existing efforts to advance and improve primary care in the state. Covered California, the Department of Healthcare Services, California Academy of Family Physicians, and Blue Shield of California have all demonstrated their commitment and are taking real action to achieve a sustainable future for primary care. And whether it's proposing legislation, building multi-stakeholder collaboratives, or launching new programs related to measurement and payment, it's clear that the people and the organizations on this panel are committed to realizing primary care as a foundation for a healthy California. And we hope this discussion can be a real stepping stone to catalyze others to join in their efforts. Now to kick us off, I, I wanna introduce our panelists here. Um, We'll go down the, the line and ask each individual to introduce yourself and to share uh, your work in strengthening primary care in California. So I'll start with Alice. Thanks so much, Megan. Um, uh, Alice Chen, a primary care internist by training, uh, currently the Chief Medical Officer for Covered California which for those of you who don't know is the state's uh, Affordable Care Act or Obamacare uh, exchange. We care for um, roughly 1.6 million Californians. And um, what I would say is while the primary mission of the marketplaces is to provide access to affordable coverage, we have from our inception um, had a mission that included quality, equity, and delivery system transformation. And as part of that, we've always understood that the foundation of any high functioning delivery system is robust primary care. Um, I think you want to keep these fairly brief, so I'm going to probably pause there to allow you to get through the other uh, panels, and I'll share a little bit more later about our specific provisions uh, around primary care. Thanks. Thank you, Alice. I'll turn it to Jackie. Hi. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Jackie Ajua, and I am Vice President of Health Transformation Acceleration at Blue Shield of California. For those who may not be in the state of California, Blue Shield is the third largest health insurer in the state. Um, my team within Blue Shield is focused on innovating and driving Blue Shield's health reimagined strategy. And one of the pillars of the health reimagined strategy is to strengthen primary care and shift from incentivizing volume-based reimbursement to, val to value-based care. 
Uh, this past year, we accelerated de deployment of our primary care reimagined program, which includes a pay for value hybrid program for primary care physicians. And we have successfully scaled that pay for value hybrid payment model to about 700 physicians. Uh, we plan to deploy this and other hybrid payment models more broadly in 2022 and beyond. Thank you, Jackie. Lisa. Hi, good afternoon. And I want to thank Manette and Blue Shield for including the California Academy of Family Physicians on this panel. I'm the CEO of CASP, and we represent the values and priorities of family physicians in California. We have over 10,000 family physician members. Family physicians as I'm sure many of you know, are specialists in primary care for all ages and all genders. And I specifically mention the values and priorities of family physicians because it is a specialty that grew out of wanting to provide high quality, whole person care in a primary care centered healthcare system. So as we'll talk about today, study after study confirms that this type of model improves patient outcomes and experience, reduces costs, improves access and equity, and reduces provider burnout. So we've been fighting for that um, really since our inception. And we, we mostly do that through advocacy and education as a recent example, um, you know, as everyone was, family physicians were devastated, but not surprised at how dramatically COVID-19 exposed failures in our system from health inequities to the fragility of the fee-for-service model. So in the wake of that, we sponsored legislation SB 402, which would bring together healthcare payers, purchasers, primary care providers, healthcare consumers, uh, all to collaborate on the establishment of a multi-payer payment reform pilot in areas hardest hit by COVID. Um, so this is just one example. We've also been leading advocacy efforts for a health plan primary care spend minimum and for changes to the way we fund and provide physician training to support and encourage primary care. And part of our efforts include collaborations. I'll end by saying we've really appreciated the opportunity to work with the organizations that are represented on this panel. The Cover California and Blue Shield have been really dedicated innovators and great collaborators in our shared drive to move toward a value-based system. Thank you. Pallav, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi everyone, Pallav Babaria, the Chief Quality Officer and Deputy Director for Quality and Population Health Management at the California Department of Healthcare Services, which is our state department that oversees our Medicaid program, which covers over 13 million beneficiaries or one in three Californians. At the department, I oversee our quality, health equity, and population health management strategies and programs. And we definitely see primary care as the cornerstone of these efforts. Without primary care, there is no pathway as far as we're concerned to health equity and population health. So really excited to join this discussion um, and share more as we go along. Thank you, Paula. Thank you to all of our panelists for joining us today. Um, and then just stepping back, also want to thank our audience. Um, we, we know it's made up of a variety of folks um, across the, the ecosystem of healthcare, both in California and representation from across the country as well. Um, so we're really delighted to have you here and um, look forward to uh, discussing the critical role that you all can play in um, advancing primary care in the future. So why don't we dive into discussion? Um, Lisa, so in the, the NASM report that I had mentioned at the top of the hour, um, it argues that primary care um, uh, payments should be really focused around the hybrid model, uh, as this emphasizes population-based payment, and it should be the default for uh, the, the system going forward. And I'm wondering if uh, you can reflect on why is the hybrid model so important? And how does it help care teams uh, develop real sustained relationships with both patients and families? Sure. Well, I'll start by saying I think a purely fee-for-service system in which we reward volume isn't working for anyone. It's not working for consumers, it's not working for payers, and it's not working for providers. We spend more than most other countries per person on uh, healthcare, and we don't get the kinds of outcomes that we would expect to see. 
So alternative payment models that focus on value, I, I think they can be structured to support those better outcomes that we're looking for. And a hybrid model gives us kind of the best of both worlds in that you primarily have a value-based payment structure, but you have some carve-outs in places where you're keeping that um, volume-based incentive, for example, with immunizations or other things that we really want to incent people to do a lot of um, so there, there are some different models, for example, AAFP's Advanced Primary Care Alternative Payment Model, which isn't dissimilar from Blue Shield's Primary Care Reimagine, includes prospective risk-adjusted primary care global payments and performance-based incentive payments. Payments structured in this way allow practices to to determine how to organize their care teams around the patient needs and invest in new services like integrative behavioral health. I think it's important to remember that medicine is an art and a science and the fee-for-service structure doesn't allow for the flexibility in care delivery as it forces practices to self-fund a lot of those non-billable activities that are needed to best serve patients and, and to improve things that are really important um, like health equity. And of course we saw that um, uh, really COVID-19 really shown an example on how fee-for-service isn't, isn't serving us there as well. Um, and fee-for-service isn't supporting practice financial continuity. When visits plummeted in COVID-19, many primary care practices struggled to stay afloat. And you quoted the, the stat from California Healthcare Foundation. It was really staggering. Some practices closed, many reduced capacity permanently, and some were bought up by venture capitalists or larger systems, um, which is uh, uh, presents potentially a whole other set of problems. And practices that are closed, they're not, they're not restaurants. They're not going to pop back up. They're probably not coming back, creating a real long-term access issue. So looking at a value-based payment model with prospective payment really helps practices to have a more stable funding system that will ultimately help sustain our infrastructure. Um, and of course, that unstable infrastructure also hurts access, but not evenly. It undermines health equity by disproportionately affecting access for low income communities. Again, we saw that with COVID um, and really makes it challenging to address health disparities. I, you know, we, I think we do have to be careful about rewarding outcomes without appropriately risk adjusting for things like English as a second language and poverty, but a value driven system will help care teams have the flexibility to address things like social determinants of health, which as we know are vitally important. Um, so last, I just wanna sort of mention alignment and administrative burden. I think one of the things that is really important to think about is that we cannot have system transformation with one or two payers introducing new payment programs. We, we have to have some consensus and alignment. New payment models have been introduced in the past, but they've been generally speaking disjointed efforts and that alignment is critical because at the end of the day, no system change will work if providers aren't on board. And many primary care physicians, particularly the small and solo practices, can't afford to make those transformation changes for only a small portion of their patient panel. Um, as it is, practice transformation can be expensive and there can be a lot of resources involved to try and stand up those new payment models. So, while larger groups may have that capital to invest, many of the smaller practices don't. And therefore, I think we really need to look at that alignment to make sure that that is viable for them and that they can be successful. So I, I could talk about the benefits of value-based payment for quite a while, but I wanna save time for other panelists. And I hope we can circle back and, and I'll elaborate on some of those points. Great, thanks very much, Lisa. And Alice, uh, we know Cov uh, Covered California has been working uh, with organizations like the California Quality Collaborative Integrated Healthcare Association around multi-payer alignment, um, and in particular uh, measures for advanced primary care. Um, and I'm wondering what the catalyst was for supporting that alignment and where you see opportunities um, around advancing uh, payment for primary care. Um, well, 
there are a multitude of reasons for alignment. I mean, just one, speaking to Lisa's point, uh, decreasing the crazy factor for providers and uh, clinicians on the front line. I think two, um, uh, thinking back to Paula's interesting mar- remarks, um, a reality check. Uh, we are the largest state-based exchange in the country, and at the same time, are less than 5% of the state's population, you know, whereas Medi-Cal is one in three Californians. Um, and then the third reason is probably is because we're a continuous uh, quality improvement organization. Uh, and I'm just going to step back for a second to explain what I mean by that. Um, we have re- had requirements around a promotion and support of primary care for many, many years. Um, We require matching with the PCP, whether you're in an HMO or PPO. We um, have requirements about targets for percentage of PCPs paid using HCP LAN 3 and 4. Um, And we are looking at requirements around primary care spend, total spend, you know, we did PCMH. And the truth is um, things haven't changed that much. So part of it is stepping back and saying, uh, what could we do to really move the dial? And so I think Uh, the idea of aligning with, uh, working with CQC, IHA, um, doing this hand in hand with CalPERS. Um, We do a lot of stuff with DHCS also, um, uh, not this particular initiative, but uh, in a number of arenas, looking to our other public purchaser partners um, to have uh, a common approach in order to cut through what I think of as this voltage drop. So we're a purchaser, we have this intent. Um, It goes through our health plans. Um, We have 11 carriers uh, in Covered California, uh, important partners, but we we recognize we're a small piece of each of their portfolios. And then they then, along with Blue Blue Shield being one of them, um, contract with all the providers and they in turn are a small piece of most uh, providers' patient panel. And so this idea that you have this voltage drop and then, uh, letting a thousand flowers bloom doesn't work out that well uh, when you're actually trying to improve care. So um, the idea was, how do we land on a parsimonious set of measures that really represent um, good team-based, whole person, uh, patient-centered care, uh, and then figure out how we then align our payment systems around it. Um, and I think some of the key attributes I would say is parsimony, again, not letting, having a 30, 40, 50, 100 different measures, um, having focus, having alignment, and importantly, recognizing that, again, in this spirit of CQI, we're not done. We have a measure set. Um, It went through an incredible stakeholder process, 18 months of uh, many, many different groups. I think in some ways, um, someone once told me, uh, if everyone is a little unhappy at the end, then you've probably done a good job because that is the nature of compromise. And so not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good, recognizing that alignment is probably more important than for each of us to get the exact measures that we want. Thank you, Alice. And Paula, um, we've heard you say that the Department um, Department of Healthcare Services, Cover California and CalPERS have had some joint meetings around alignment and that primary care is a really big focus of of this uh, agenda. Um, And when we think about teams delivering advanced primary care, where do you see that synergy between population health management and primary care and Medi-Cal? And and what is uh, the intersection around payment in that space? So a few things. For those of you who aren't in California or enmeshed in the California Medi-Cal space, we have a transformative policy initiative called CalAIM, uh, which is being rolled out as we speak and is really going to overhaul how multiple parts of our Medicaid program work across the state, at the county level, at the plan level, at the provider level. And as a part of that policy initiative, we are putting in very clear population health requirements for all of our managed Medi-Cal plans which have not been requirements across the state before. Um, And when we say population health management, we mean not just the complex uh, case management programs, benefits like enhanced care management and community supports or in lieu of services, but we really mean the entire pyramid. So how are we looking at the entire population? How are we reprioritizing prevention and upstream interventions? I think all of us can recognize if we learned anything from COVID, it is that the healthcare system, once folks are complex and in the hospital or the ICU, um, is not probably the best place to be intervening and that we really need to think about our upstream preventive infrastructure, what our relationships with local communities and public health look like. And so our entire population health management strategy is really designed to achieve that. And 
all of those pathways, as I said before, go through primary care in some way, shape, or form. I think, obviously, we try to align with CalPERS and Covered California as much as possible. The Medicaid program is subject to different regulatory requirements. Um, our practice models are, are different, so our members are served through a variety of different practices, whether that's federally qualified health centers, some of the smaller practices, as Lisa was saying, large healthcare systems. And we do need to tailor those strategies to each of those different practice environments. Um, so a few ways in which we are doing this practice practically, as many people in the state know, uh, but others may not, we are currently in the process of releasing an RFP to re-procure all of our managed Medi-Cal commercial contracts and really being intentional about what is our population health management strategy, how are we thinking about primary care within those contracts. We know that within Medi-Cal specifically, we have a fair amount of underutilization, especially for certain populations like children. Medi-Cal recipients are less likely to have a regular um, place of care where they have continuity with the provider. And as we've seen with COVID vaccine rollout, that trusting relationship with the provider that you have continuity is critical for people's health outcomes. So we're thinking through how we foster that and how we engage populations who traditionally haven't been engaged in primary care. And that was going to be central to our health equity strategy as well. In addition, in both our contracts and in our um, forthcoming comprehensive quality strategy, which we'll be publishing, value-based payments are a critical piece of that. And as I alluded to, how we do that varies by practice. So we currently are working on with our federally qualified health center partners across the state, um, a pilot for an alternative payment model with the FQHCs, um, which will be voluntary, but really excited about this opportunity to get out of that you know, reactive fee-for-service model, which is even more restrictive for federally qualified health centers than a lot of other practices. And it will allow our health centers to truly serve the role in the community and think about population health more broadly than their financial structures enable them to do today. At the state level, the other piece that we're really tying to primary care is how do we leverage those community-based relationships? How do we think about primary care's intersection with schools, with their local health jurisdictions, that we are really pushing the boundaries of what the four walls of a primary care clinic and healthcare delivery looks like into the community, because that's where the needs are and that's where health starts and ends. Great, thank you, Palav. A lot going on in the department these days. Uh, now, Jackie, um, the need for more flexibility and predictability in payment, um, I know was a big factor in terms of Blue Shield's decision to implement its hybrid model um, called Primary Care Reimagined. And I'm wondering, especially given COVID, it seems like there was a recognition to immediately invest in primary care and you're using this model as, as one avenue to do so. Um, but how does the, the work in general uh, really tie into the perspectives that we've heard so far from Lisa, Palav, and um, Alice? Thanks, Megan. So it's a really, it's a really good fit. Um, we at Blue Shield had already started the model designed for the people value hybrid model when COVID hit. And uh, the pandemic really emphasized the need to, to quickly scale the model and get regular predictable dollars into primary care as quickly as possible. Um, I don't need to mention the numbers uh, that Lisa quoted earlier, um, but you know, people were delaying care and practices that relied on a fee-for-service revenue to, to, well, to make payroll and, and, and run the business were really struggling. Um, so that's why we, we decided we haven't done this as broadly as we have to date, uh, but it was important for us to move forward. And we knew that we would figure things out of the way. And we had gotten a fair amount of input already into what worked and what didn't work. Uh, we didn't design this in isolation. So uh, a hybrid model is intended to offer practices flexibility in the way that they deliver care. Um, we, we, with primary care reimagined, we're paying care teams to care for people, uh, not doctors to deliver services. So we pay practices, prospective population-based payments with ongoing fee-for-service payments for services like immunizations. We already mentioned that briefly and other, other preventative services where we want more volume. And we also use quality incentives as well. Uh, Blue Shield had also committed to align with the advanced primary care measure set that was mentioned earlier. 
Importantly, our original measure set actually deviated from the advanced priority care set, but our leadership made the decision to commit to alignment. Because like you mentioned earlier, um, I'm gonna use Alice's example, largest in the country, but only a certain proportion of the state of California divvied up among the 11 different carriers and then further divvied up among different providers. So it could be a really small slice of the population when you look at any carrier. And if you have physicians trying to manage different measure care sets, it really dilutes their ability to focus on what they really want to do, which is provide care and do clinical care. Um, so we, we, it, that meant to us that to commit to that alignment so we could have a lot more people driving towards the population-based and value-based care that we want and need, uh, we had to compromise and make changes so that we can enable consistent collection and reporting of different measures while reducing the administrative burden on providers. And it's important that we understand that that alignment that relieves that burden on, on practices. And, and these decisions that, that were made reflect the larger purpose of primary health, primary care reimagined, which is making life easier for practices. And the practices in our model gain access to an array of technology including better data via our paper value platform, as well as practice level consulting services. Practices get insight into heated measures and care gaps, financial metrics, utilization, and much more. Um, it's not an easy decision to make. I should mention that for our primary care providers within this model, we're predicting based on analysis of data from 2019 that they could get reimbursed up to 50% more than what they got in our fee-for-service model. And that's a, that's a big investment. And that will raise some skepticism, which I think we might, might come up a little bit later in the conversation. Like, why would you all of a sudden want to throw money at me? Why do you want to pay me so much money, right? Um, but it's, in addition to that, it's also, and we understand and realize that big operational challenge to fundamentally change payment for primary care. So there are things that have to change. I, I believe Lisa mentioned earlier on how you how you run you run the operations of a clinic when you're doing fee for service is different from how you do it when it's capitated. And then if you take a hybrid of the two, there's another system you're trying to think how you manage through that, especially when it's a smaller practice. So uh, in summary, we recognize practices are meeting the pressing needs of our members every day. So we're committed to supporting them to maintaining a vibrant and sustainable practice that's personally and professionally rewarding. And we think that primary care reimagine helps to achieve that goal. Great, thank you, Jackie. Now I, I wanna ask the audience um, to feel free to share any questions that you may have um, by using the, the Q&A button at the, the bottom of the webinar. Um, our moderators will consolidate their questions and um, we'll share them with us. But as, as uh, folks are writing in where they do have questions, um, I wanted to do a, a quick lightning round. Um, so a, across all four panelists, um, you know, there is some skepticism around the idea of uh, payment uh, reform here. Um, and I want to see what, what would you say to uh, those folks who would prefer to keep the status quo? Um, they may be skeptical of the type of change or they believe um, you know, it's been tried before or the burden is just too great um, to implement. So I'll start with, with Lisa. I guess sort of two major things. One is that change is gonna happen whether we plan for it or not. Um, so I would say we need to try and be thoughtful and do it as, um, as well as we can. And with as much planning, I know change is scary. And certainly we have concerns about, for example, how costs are attributed. Um, but I, I really believe that ultimately a better healthcare system benefits most stakeholders. We need to be realistic that there will be some folks who will need to significantly adjust. Um, but I think that again, ultimately we're gonna have to make change whether we, whether we like it or not. And I think it's important to really be thoughtful about it. The other thing is that this is not an academic discussion. Um, you know, we've managed to hobble along with policy duct tape, but it isn't sustainable. And what happens in the next public health crisis? I think, you know, healthcare is not known for its quick systemic shifts. 
Um, but we saw what the health what the healthcare system can do. I mean, we had physician practices that had never done telemedicine on a Friday, and we're doing all telemedicine by Monday morning. So I think it's really encouraging, and um, and I think we we can make change, and we can make change that ultimately benefits most stakeholders. Thank you, Lisa. Alex, what's your take on that? How do you convince skeptics? All right, I'm not sure I'm going to convince skeptics, but what I would say is, you know, we can't afford the status quo. I mean, I think it was Lisa who said, I mean, we spend 50% more than other any other industrialized country. We have worse outcomes when you look at like the things that matter, like life expectancy, and a lot of it's driven by disparities. I think COVID really, like, you know, really should have made us all sit up and pay attention. Like population, I mean, we have, we're putting 18% of our GDP into healthcare and are we getting health, right? And when you look at population health, in my mind, there are only three, three entities that could conceivably own part of it. And it's public health, right? Which is sorely, sorely underfunded. Um, primary care, which is also underfunded um, and actually health plans because they are paid PM, PM to take care of people. And so it feels to me like, at least in California, there is this critical mass. So on the one hand, we can't afford the status quo. On the other hand, in California in particular, I think it's really exciting because there's this critical mass of, of, of organizations across the spectrum who are really committed um, to driving change in primary care. And so no one group can do it on its own, right? Practices need the support of health plans. And you heard about Blue Shield's technical assistance and, and, the, and the tools that they're giving. And purchasers need to, you know, really keep um, payers feet to the fire. Like we need to be all in it together. So I'd say like we can't afford it. Um, and we have this incredible opportunity here in California. Thanks, Alice. Paula, how about you? So Alice made a great economic argument. <laughs> we make the moral argument, which is, you know, why are we all here, right? You know, I can, most of the patients I've taken care of in my primary care practice and our members, you know, yes, do they want state of the art care when they have really complex needs or get critically ill? Yes, but even that we do not distribute that access or those outcomes equitably anywhere across our state or our nation. But what people really want is to lead happy, healthy, long lives that are free of illness to as much as we can prevent it. Um, and so I think that there is this amazing opportunity using the, you know, all of that COVID has illuminated for us and the gaps in our healthcare system to rethink how do we do this in a way that is actually going to meet the needs of our members and our communities? Because our healthcare system today is not doing that. Thanks, Paula. And Jackie, what's your response? Well, you always have a few skeptics, but we can't just put our hats down and walk away, right? The, the numbers have been shared. There was a recent report, I think it came out either earlier this year or late last year, that of all the OECD countries, we ranked 11th. And quality wasn't very one of those higher scores for us either. And we spend more money, I think, than the country of Finland, their entire budget, not healthcare just their entire budget. So we can't keep throwing money at it. There obviously is much more that we have to do. Uh, in terms of skepticism, one of the biggest areas is we don't pay enough for, for uh, providers to do this extra work or how do they know we won't change our minds and try to do something different next time or you're holding me to these quality stamp targets and I can't meet them, therefore I'm not really gonna get this revenue that you're promising me, um, which is why our plan emphasizes the monthly payments rather than the quality bump being the biggest part of the actual increase. Um, I'm gonna do the emotional appeal. I, I, I'm not gonna tell you that we've solved for all the operational barriers. I have a lot of people on, on my teams and working with vendors who have rolled this out. And we learned a few lessons in the course of doing this. Um, definitely, I'm sure there'll be some Q&A around that. We haven't solved for all of those. The data flow that's required for us to risk adjust the population-based fees um, but, you know, like I mentioned earlier, that value-based payment platform that we've implemented and integrated with our claims processing is one step in automating these hybrid payments. It also provides comprehensive data to participating uh, physicians who can use the information to assess their panel, their performance, and then they can make adjustments as necessary to improve, to, to provide improved quality care. So here's the impassioned plea, right? If it wasn't clear enough to us already that a system incentivizing volume versus quality is unsustainable, COVID-19 definitely highlighted the issue for us. 
So if it's not us, and we already talked about who are the stakeholders who can actually make this change, not just us on this panel, but the stakeholders, all of you in the audience as well, if it's not us, then who? And if it's not now, then when? Do we wait for another crisis to come upon us? Thank you, Jackie. Thank you for all of your responses there. And, and I think just to, to dig in a little deeper around that, that equity question, you know, we, we referenced the, the NASM report earlier on um, at the beginning of the session. And that report um, kind of built the case around investments in primary care having the capacity uh, to really improve health equity um, more than any other investment in the healthcare system. And I think we're, um, you've been touching on that and particularly in this, this last response, but I'm wondering if you can really elaborate on, on what that connection is and how can, uh, how can people see that more explicitly? Um, so how can the investment in primary care really advance equity? Um, again, I'll, I'll kind of go down the, the, the panel. Um, Lisa, do you want to begin there? Yeah, I, I mean, I had mentioned earlier several ways, but I think really importantly, it allows care teams to have flexibility to address the issues of the patient population and, and the patient that, that's in front of them. And so the care that they receive may, may be a little bit different. It may be that um, rather than you know, sort of spending more time on one thing, they want to spend more time on something else, um, behavioral health, for example. I think we also have an opportunity with value-based payment to do some risk adjustment. So it's not one payment for one service, regardless of the, the, the patient and, and their needs and issues. Um, and then when we're looking at quality, um, that's also a huge issue and outcomes. And um, again, giving those care teams the flexibility to, to really look at the patient in front of them to kind of develop a strategy that, that works for them rather than this um, global approach. And then lastly, you know, the way we pay for healthcare, um, it, it incentivizes certain care. And I, I'm not sure that what we pay for now, including a real emphasis on specialty care, is, is serving um, all populations equally because some of that primary and preventative care, um, you know, there may be uh, upper income folks that have um, resources to um, address some of those primary care needs in a way and in an environment outside of the clinic environment. So it, there are all of these things that I think feed into it. And, you know, that's not even talking about infrastructure. As I, as I mentioned when I, um, uh, after your first question, um, you know, the truth of the matter is in COVID-19 practices that closed or had to reduce capacity, those were not equally distributed those practices were largely in low income areas. And as I said, they're probably not coming back, which further exacerbates the access issue. So it, it's kind of a tough tie, I think, for folks, but payment really does affect not only how much you pay, but how you pay, which is what we're talking about, has such a huge impact on health equity. And I'm so glad that you asked that question because I think sometimes that can get lost. And as I said, it becomes sort of an academic discussion about payment, but at the end of the day, it really is about how we deliver care and who gets care and, and when they get it. Thanks. And Paula, do you have further thoughts on that? I know you're, you're going there earlier. <laughs> Lots. Um, you know, so I think it just want to underscore Lisa's last comment about the access. We know that access is not evenly distributed across our state to primary care, specialty care, or even hospital care, depending on where you live. Um, we have rural regions that have significant workforce and access shortages. We have low income neighborhoods, even in urban areas where we have access shortages. And these are the same populations that maybe are already disadvantaged, don't have childcare, can't get time off of work for their meeting their medical needs, don't have reliable sources of transportation. And then they also have to travel further to access the care that they need. So I think some of this is around 
when you look at the clinical outcomes data, there are clear disparities by race, by ethnicity, by geography, by income level um, for pretty much every condition, whether you're looking at diabetes outcomes, you know, rates of cardiovascular disease, cancer, and the most disadvantaged communities tend to present later with more advanced disease. And so if they had reliable access and high quality primary care, much of that disease would be detected at an earlier stage. Um, we obviously also recognize that there are significant social drivers of health outside of the healthcare delivery system. What type of food you have access to in your neighborhood? Can you even get fruit, fresh fruits and vegetables? Um, are there safe areas for you to exercise outside of your home? You know, and we need to address all of those social drivers as well. Um, but there's clearly a healthcare component here that is not evenly distributed. And so I think as we think about primary care, that is a reliable way to close some of those gaps between how um, much disease burden there is in certain communities and certain populations and close the racial, ethnic, and other disparities that we see across the state of California. Thank you. And, and Alice, I'm wondering how uh, Cover California is, is seeing this as an opportunity for addressing equity issues as well. Um, you know, I'm gonna step back from one second, which is just in terms of when I when you ask the question about what's the role of primary care and equity, I mean, I oftentimes go back to Barbara Starfield's tenets of primary care, you know, accessible, um, whole person, longitudinal, comprehensive, and that whole person piece of it, I think, really leads directly to equity. I mean, like when you start asking someone about their whole person, um, it very often leads to community, and it also oftentimes leads to uncovering these um, drivers of health issues, social drivers of health, which, you know, um, I know Pallav and I uh, have spent our clinical time in the safety net, but frankly, it's really interesting. It's not just about the safety net. The the, the prevalence of food insecurity, uh, marginal housing, I mean, like, is just very profound once you start looking at it um, uh, beyond the traditional safety net. So I would say primary care, again, just by dint of um, its function and how in its best form, I think is very logically situated. And, and that's another reason why we need to support it in terms of covered California. Um, our disparities work has been a little bit of parallel play with our advanced primary care work, although we're trying to kind of um, co-evolve it in terms of some of the measurement, looking at uh, stratification by race, ethnicity in particular, and now looking at income and really trying to figure out um, how do we uh, just even first better understand in our population and then uh, structure our payments and financial incentives around really um, having a specific focus on, on closing um, uh, equity gaps. Okay, thank you, Alice. And Jackie, I know we've covered a lot of territory here, but other thoughts around um, the connection between primary care and equity here? Yeah, I wanted to connect because I, I don't think we've, we've left anything on the table, really, um, Paula, what Paula and, and Alice mentioned around social determinants of health. And, and that investment for some of the work we've done on the Blue, uh, Blue Shield of California is really investing in community health workers. So community health and, and some of the better successes that we've seen is embedding them within practices and helping having them help to identify and surface these social determinants of health issues that usually are, most of the time you'll find that you tend to find that more in people who are either economically disadvantaged, all the other uh, underrepresented, speak different languages, et cetera. So that's another way, and that's not necessarily a payment model, though we are doing some work around how we can get that to be something that is reimbursed, you know, it's a longer term um, outcome that we would like to have. But that's another way that we're also looking at it, that we can't solve everything in the, it's everything isn't solvable by a clinical type intervention. There are other environmental and social factors that also have to be considered. Great, thank you, Jackie. Um, I know we, we have a number of questions um, coming in from the audience as well. Uh, and one of those was around how payers can support primary care practices um, in developing capacity to succeed in alternative payment models, um, whether it's potentially through um, staffing capacity, office staffing, billing and coding, or other supports. Um, so Lisa, would, would love your thoughts on, on that one. Yeah, well, if I had to pick one thing, it would be alignment. 
Um, and I mentioned that earlier, but it is really hard for physician practices to make changes in their workflow and their models if it is for one payer or even two payers, but they have multiple payers and that may represent 5% of their patient panel. And it ends up, while they, they may be enthusiastic about the program and the change, it ends up really resulting in a significant amount of administrative burden and investment that quite frankly, if they're making an upfront investment in the kinds of things that have to happen, including technology and shifts in, in staffing and um, sort of team-based approach, and even in the way that their offices are set up, which is sometimes an important part of it, um, that all takes a lot of resources. And so it's just not viable for them to do all of that for just a very small segment of their patient population. It doesn't, it doesn't pencil out for them as, as enthusiastic as, as they may be. Um, so, you know, that's sort of the, the thing I'd like to emphasize there, the, the more um, probably obvious things that uh, for many practices, and we saw this in COVID, they don't have capital reserves. So if, if a program is requiring a big shift in their electronic health record, or as I said, in staffing, those may not be resources that they have, even if it, at, at sort of at the end, they're receiving augmented payment for doing some of these things that still requires an upfront cost. And I think what we, what we have seen is that a lot of practices are pretty financially fragile and don't have those resources to invest in the first place. So I would say that that's a piece of it as well, providing that financial support. Um, and then, you know, the, the other piece of it is collaboration. And I think we can design the very best models from the, the smartest people in the country. And if you don't have a cultural shift, from providers um, really wanting to embrace that, it's probably not going to work no matter how great it is on paper. So I think that collaboration piece is really essential. So it is a collaboration between stakeholders like physicians and uh, Blue Shield or Cover California, the Department of Healthcare Services, I think that is absolutely essential to getting provider buy-in and, um, and really helping to make sure that programs that are, that are different um, and that are new are a success. And just lastly, I'll say, I think we also need to um, acknowledge some provider skepticism because for most of our physician members, they've seen the, the they've seen the program roll out that's going to change healthcare and it hasn't, or it's been such a small piece of the puzzle that it hasn't had a systemic change. And so I think we need to acknowledge that. And that sort of goes back to the collaborations. They need to be a part of that conversation before it is, here's a new program that you need to implement in, in your practice. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, another question from the audience um, is around social uh, determinants of, of health. So um, given the importance of social determinants for overall health outcomes, uh, what data sources or metrics are um, most important to integrate into payment models uh, to incentivize healthy activities and improve social drivers? Um, and Pulav, I'll, I'll ask this of you. Um, so I would start with, you know, I think many of our payment models and risk assessment models have historically relied on claims data. And we know there are vast differences in utilization by different populations, by race and ethnicity, and that those claims data don't always actually represent the clinical or social needs and complexity of our populations. So we at Department of Healthcare Services, as we launch our population health management program, um, are going to be launching a population health management service, which is going to be a statewide population health analytics platform. And we are having these exact conversations. How do we get an accurate understanding of the clinical risk, as well as the social risk of our population and individual beneficiaries? And that means looking at things, you know, yes, utilization, but also getting actual electronic health record data feeds. We know that there's much in the clinical environment that doesn't translate into 
um, you know, the, the claims data based off of all of the coding and billing. And as a provider, I know, you know, we providers are not great always at accurately coding and billing. Um, we're also looking at, you know, at the state level, how do we aggregate other department from, or other data from other departments, you know, SNAP or CalFresh, enrollment information, information from our social services departments. Um, we have something in California called the Healthy Places Index, which is a composite score of how, um, you know, essentially healthy communities are versus not using a number of different factors, including you know, employment data, local educational data, et cetera. And so we really need to understand the full picture at both the individual beneficiary level, as well as the community level, and then, you know, incorporate that into our planning at all levels, you know, at the population health um, program planning level, the payment level, et cetera. And then I will also just say, I think as policymakers, we need to think about how do we embed that into our policy writ large. And so really exciting time to be in California because we are expanding a number of benefits. You know, Jackie had talked earlier about community health workers. We are launching that as a new statewide benefit. We are launching doula services as a new statewide benefit through the CalAIM policy transformation work, we're going to be launching this enhanced care management benefit, which really looks at certain high-risk populations, those who are justice involved, have um, severe mental illness, substance use disorders, complex children, et cetera, to really ensure that they are getting the care coordination and support that they need for their multiple conditions, as well as looking at community support. So, you know, yes, in current state, our healthcare system will pay for 10 ED visits for an asthma exacerbation, but we won't pay for someone to go into a family's home and get rid of that bedding that is, you know, causing the asthma exacerbations um, and to provide air filters if they live in an area, especially in California, where there's wildfire smoke. And so really thinking through how can the health care system, pay for the upstream interventions that we know that work and will reduce downstream utilization. And Megan, do you mind if I jump in here um, <laughs> on a couple of things? I will just get on a soapbox very, very briefly, I promise, uh, around this term social determinants of health. For anyone who has not read John Auerbach's uh, health affairs blog from a few years ago about social determinants of health versus drivers of health or social health-related social needs, I think it's very much worthwhile, particularly in the setting of kind of historic federal investments in social safety nets, right? Because those are the things that really address social determinants of health, getting rid of food deserts, making sure that people actually have housing, not the, the things we're talking about are super important. And we need to be clear about what we're talking about. And what I would um, say, want to flag for people on this call is that, that the uh, NQF, the National Quality Forum, is actually having a vote next week, I believe, on the first um, uh, drivers of health measures that CMS is considering. So uh, using the accountable health community model um, screening question. So there's a measure around screening for health related social needs and the percent positivity. And I would say anybody who cares about this area should weigh into NQF because um, it is really important that we get these measures into uh, the CMS ecosystem so that we can actually uh, start collecting the data in a systematic way. So that was a soapbox and a PSA. Great. <laughs> Thank you, Alice. Um, I think that oh, we have time for one final uh, audience question. And um, this one's for Jackie. Uh, and as end users of the, the Blue Shield uh, primary care reimagined model, um, there's a question of whether providers had input into its design. And do you foresee any type of iteration um, based on experience with implementation over time? Yes, so we definitely had provider input into the design. Um, we did a pilot, we, first we piloted it. We got, the, we got input, we made some changes based on the input that we got. We actually did have, this is what we would even call internally a 2.0 version of what we had initially. The initial CCP plan we had we call that 1.0. We got a lot of input and feedback and evolved it to where we are today. And um, uh, Dr. Birnbaum, who's on my team at Blue Shield, uh, we were on an internal call yesterday and she said, um, we are definitely not perfect. We are bringing you our best work and please you know, feel free to poke at it. We'll learn more just like you have in any uh, drug in the, as I'm a pharmacist by training, as you go through the FDA approval process, you test it with a small number of people, you test it with a larger number of people, 
you learn a lot more and then you start to evolve. So we know that as we scale it even broader than the 700 we have this, this year or this, and what we're looking at doing next year and beyond, we will learn more and we will find that there's probably opportunity to continue to iterate on it. I wanna add one other thing to the previous question um, around that question where we talked about when we're selecting metrics, we wanna make sure the metrics we select, the measures we do are those that are disparity sensitive and measures that we know we will see difference in rates based on race. And then also be able to share that data back. There was an advisory council that Blue Shield pulled together that included physicians. It was regionally diverse and the specialist diverse, and we also had community partners. And they said, this particular physician said, no doctor thinks that they're treating their patients disparately, that they're treating them differently. Um, nobody's walking into the room and saying, I'm going to treat you different because you're a BIPOC person than I'm going to treat another person. And so the data can be surprising. So we have also a responsibility to share the data back with the providers that highlights the disparities that exist within their practices. And we're working on this as a pilot right now. In addition to that, it's, this is all great and fancy and dandy, right? But how much race and ethnicity and uh, SOGI information do we actually have? We don't have a lot of that. We might impute it, but what you see and what people are is not necessarily always the same. And so we have a lot of work to do around that. And that's some of the work we're doing right now to get that data and make sure that it's bi-directional, that we can get it, how that we can use it in a meaningful way and that it flows back and forth between the health plans of the carriers and the providers. Great, thank you very much, Jackie. Um, so just in our last three minutes here, I wanted to do one final lightning round um, and, and that being around this call to action. Um, so really wanting to, to share with the audience your top of mind immediate actions that key constituents um, can take to support primary care in, uh, in California's future. Um, so, you know, in our paper, we had talked about doubling down on alignment efforts with existing coalitions. Um, providers putting pressure on plans to prioritize and really invest in primary care, and then payers and purchasers testing these hybrid models, um, and as Jackie noted, refining uh, based on early adoption. So just want to run down the panel again and, and ask, you know, wh what are those steps uh, that you can call to action for the audience? Um, and I'll start with, uh, let's go kind of reverse order this time. Um, Jackie, why don't we start with you? Okay, um, so I was expecting to go last, first of all, because that's been the pattern so far. <laughs> it's a little bit of humor to wrap this out. Um, you know, we, we, are con we are committed to continue to learn and evolve. I think that's the most important thing with the understanding that we don't know it all and we can't take things that are completely fully baked without input from others and expect it to be really successful out in the real world. I think that that would be the most important thing to share as we conclude this panel. Thank you. Alice, how about you? Um, I uh, would second Jackie's um, uh, need to continually evolve this because you know we don't have the perfect model. I think I would, uh, if there's one thing I would exhort everyone on this call to, would be sounding um, uh, what I think it was Lisa who had said collaboration. I think um, particularly in healthcare, uh, it's not always clear what is a common good, what, what is a fodder for competition versus collaboration. I think primary care as the NASM report called out is a public good, it's a common good. And I think this is an area where we should set some of our differences aside and really try to collaborate. Thank you. And Paula? I mean, I think as we, for our Medi-Cal journey, really try to create a system that is whole system and person-centered and lives up to the goals and ideals we have for all of our members. Um, I don't think there's question in our minds about where we're headed, but lots of questions on how, you know, to both what Jackie and Alice said, like the path is, is not clear and there's going to be a lot of lessons learned and collaboration and out of the box thinking. And that's going to need to happen at all levels. So especially for those of you on the call from the state of California, um, you know, we're going to want your input and collaboration and ideas as we go down this journey. And Lisa. 
I would just emphasize that there's a role for all stakeholders and all stakeholders have to keep the pressure on. It's, it's not going to be enough for just payers or just consumers or just providers or just policymakers. Um, I don't think there's a lot of debate about the importance of primary care and the role that primary care can have in reducing cost, improving outcomes, um, improving health equity. So I really think it's about prioritizing, and that's why I would say we just have to keep the pressure on. I think we're in a little bit of a moment um, now post-COVID where folks that don't care about health policy are paying attention, and I think that's really important. Um, so I would say payers. Payers have to demand that policymakers and plans prioritize primary care. Um, Consumers need to keep the pressure on to for their lawmakers and their health plans and their employers. And I would say here with consumers, it's it's not someone else's problem. Even if you aren't on Medi-Cal or you're happy with your health plan, you're still paying for it. You're paying for the dysfunction of our healthcare system, whether you know it or not. And so I think that there's a really important role for consumers here too. Providers, we need to keep the pressure on to make sure that one, we're collaborating in our case with our specialty colleagues to try and build some, um, some understanding around why this is important changes in the system and why it can be good for everyone. And of course, there's policymakers, and I don't just mean legislators, although they're important, but amazing um, policy influencers like uh, Dr. Chen and Dr. Barbaria who are on, on the call today. So I, I guess that that is where I would want to leave is just there is a really important role for everyone. Thank you very much. This has been incredibly thoughtful and appreciate um, all of your consideration in, in today's panel. Um, just as a, a reminder for uh, the folks who are listening in, um, you can download a copy of the paper um, at the end of this webinar, you'll have access to that. And then Manat will also um, send out an on-demand link um, following the session. So thank you all for joining and thank you very much to our panelists for this good discussion. Take care. Thank you, bye-bye.